Most people approve of capital punishment, but most people wouldn't do the hangman's job. Canada still had capital punishment until 1976, with the final execution taking place actually in 1962. I thought I'd look into some of the reasons why some people of the past were executed, along with who were the executioners, and what ultimately led to this practice coming to an end in Canada and England. The beginning of our story originates with John Radcliffe, in 1892, as he became Canada's official hangman. His salary was a modest $700, or about $18,000 a year. John had been a part of hangings before in the British Navy, which is what is thought to have led him to one of his first moves, and this move was to change the method of execution from a drop to a jerk. The old plan was discarded for what John dubbed a more merciful machine in which the prisoner is jerked up from a platform by a weight of 280 pounds or more. And when the words, forgive us our trespasses are read, the executioner would cut the rope holding that weight, and at the other end would be the noose. So in a flash, it would plummet to the earth while the condemned was jerked into the air and left hanging. So this method was popular in the Royal Navy when hanging pirates in the South China Sea. The earliest known sentence to be carried out in Canada was done on a yard arm in 1748 when a sailor was stabbed by another in Halifax. This means of execution wasn't in use long though, only lasting from about 1888 to 1890, with a Reginald Burchell as one of the final to be executed by this method. Reginald was from England where his family paid for his college that he wasted partying and incurring debt from money lenders until finally traveling to Canada to scout out his new fraud. The plan was to trick wealthy people with an ad in London newspapers posing as a racehorse farmer looking for investors. Really, he just planned to bet the money on horse races? Uh, somewhat unfortunately for Reginald though, the investors wanted to see the estate before so he took Frederick Benwell, who was the son of one of the investors, to the farm, only to quickly shoot him in the head twice after he disapproved of the location. It was after this Benwell's father in England was telegraphed saying that his son had agreed to invest and immediately should wire over the 500 pounds, which is about as much as Radcliffe made in a year. Not even three days later, Hunters found the body in a swamp with clothing tags removed. Photos were circulated in local papers of the body at the time. So some of the members of the investor group recognized him, went and identified the body. Since both men were of nobility, the trial and execution became a sensation in newspapers in England. At eight and a half exactly, two minutes after the drop fell, his pulse was felt by Dr. McClurg and his was beating at the rate of 60 pulsations to the minute. For one and a half minutes longer, the body continued to show signs of life, and two and a half minutes later, the doctor pronounced life extinct. His spirit had gone, if for weal or for woe, is known but to one. The body was allowed to remain hanging for 12 minutes longer, or about 18 minutes in all. It was also around this time that he was noted for developing a nasty drinking problem, with people around him being in awe of the amount he actually could drink, drinking his beer from the bottle, never using a glass. I used to say to condemned persons as I beckoned with my hand, come with me. Now at night when I lie down, I start with a roar as a victim after victim comes up before me. I can see them on the trap waiting a second before they face their maker. They taunt me and haunt me until I am nearly crazy with an unearthly fear. I will go to hell, sure, and terrible punishment, for I am two hundred times a murderer, but I won't kill another man. I had always thought capital punishment was right, but not now. 
I believe the Almighty will visit the Christian nations with dire calamity if they don't stop taking the lives of their fellows, no matter how heinous the crime. Murderers should be allowed to live as long as possible and work out their salvation on behalf of the state. It is the only solution for the stamp of Cain is on my brow and the brow of the government and the brow of the nation as long as capital punishment is practiced on this globe. The torment of what he was doing came out in interviews at the time, with him declaring, When I am dead, tell the people the hangman suffered the tortures of hell on earth, after he killed a hundred persons, and I wish to God I would die right now. The strain is killing me. At the age of 55, he would get his wish, and he passed on from cirrhosis of the liver. His position was taken over by his apprentice of over 20 hangings named Arthur Ellis, but his actual name was Arthur English. English, unlike Radcliffe, had decided to use the pseudonym of Arthur B. Ellis after the famous English hangman, John Ellis. Both would somewhat ironically have a career ended in tragedy. The man he took his name from, John Ellis, had been involved in over 200 executions, but one of his last was said to have an impact. This case was of Edith Thompson in 1923. Edith, in connection with Frederick Bywaters, was judged for the murder of her husband, Percy Thompson. The hanging was an ordeal since Edith was in a state of hysteria days before the execution, so on the day, Thompson was heavily drugged. This was done often to change the behavior of the damned, even being encouraged since it calmed them. Sedatives were provided by the authorities, as it was seen as not only a more humane way of slaughter, but also usually made them easier to get into the noose. This was not the case for Edith Thompson, though. The morning of her execution, she collapsed, resulting in four men having to drag her to the scaffold and hold her upright while they put the noose around her neck. People said at the time guards had to tie her to a small wooden chair before drying the noose around her neck. Large demonstrations occurred in its support of Edith's innocence, since even the murderer at the time confessed she had nothing to do with it. She was implicated by many love letters to Frederick Bywaters, the accused. In them, she wrote of attempts to poison and kill Percy with ground glass. Bywaters admitted he confronted them in the streets to address this affair. Mr. Thompson ended up getting into a fight with him that knocked Edith to the ground, resulting in him getting stabbed to death. The neighbors could overhear her shrieking, no, don't, repeatedly into the night air. Edith was discovered alone in a distressed state when police arrived to bring her into the station where she gave up Bywaters right away, thinking herself to be a witness and even informing them of the affair. After they arrested Bywaters, they found all of the letters which spoke of wanting to kill Percy, resulting in them both charged with intent to end a life. It wasn't known at the time, but after the hanging, it was remarked that the sudden drop caused massive vaginal hemorrhaging. This large amount of blood, including the fact that Thompson still put on weight while in prison as she refused food, led many to believe that she had miscarried. A year later, John Ellis made his first endeavor in his own life by shooting himself in the jaw only to survive, stating that Thompson's final moments tortured him. Due to the suicide attempt, Ellis was charged with a criminal offense and kept locked up for a year. Some dispute that it was this singular moment that got to Ellis, but the thought of murdering one innocent is sufficient to drive someone into madness, let alone the possibility of killing her unborn child was finally eight years later, after continued alcohol abuse, that he would cut his own throat with a razor and succeed in taking his life. This brings us back to Arthur Ellis, who said he accumulated the name not for fear of his own life, but because he feared harassment upon his family. I fear nobody. I do my duty. I publish my picture and my name in the papers. I walk the streets daily. Every morning sees me at the Montreal post office. 
I fulfill the orders of the justice, and only a lunatic would hold me personally responsible for that. And from attacks by lunatics, nobody is immune. The secrecy that I maintain concerning my identity and residence is for the purpose of protecting my family from cranks and nuisances. The name Arthur Ellis became interchangeable with the word hanging in Canada, as he alone seemed to over 300 of the 700 known. One of his lasts would similarly be a woman, Tomisa Tilos in Montreal, who was executed along with two other men for murdering her husband for insurance money. The executions were to be performed at the same time, but the scaffold at the prison didn't permit for it. This forced him to hang the two men simultaneously. Neither men's necks snapped when the trap occurred causing them to both slowly suffocate while spectators watched on in horror. When it came time for Telos, Ellis didn't know the incorrect weight for her was in his possession. The prison never owned any scales. Therefore, estimating weights of prisoners was the only method guards had, which resulted in her being decapitated on the fall. Ellis was noted for saying, it indicated an average of 145 pounds. Naturally, I allowed for a greater drop, but in fact, she weighed 187 pounds. The law of gravity tore her head off. A million dollar institution without a twenty dollar pair of scales. News of this bungled execution traveled to Boston, where the switch to the electric chair was glorified, and across the ocean to England where demonstrations were held again regarding capital punishment. After this incident, future executions were no longer open to the public and sheriffs just ceased assigning work to Ellis. The pay of a hangman was insignificant as is, with Ellis said to only make between $50 to $75 at each job. This resorted him and Radcliffe to be known for selling the ropes as souvenirs to people, and some had stated that they had seen them purchasing the lengths of ropes they'd need to sell as souvenirs in shops after. He died in poverty, all alone, from an alcohol-related illness like Radcliffe, July 21st, 1938. Once retired, he said, Nobody suffered more than I have when I had to use those antiquated conditions. The final hangman in Canada's history was more successful in using a pseudonym. Not much is known about him. A lot of this could be attributed to the press no longer being invited, or the public. What is known about him is that Camille Branchard served on several prolific cases in Canada, such as the hanging of four Nazi POWs in Medicine Hat, Alberta, when they murdered two of their own after Hitler granted orders from Germany to eliminate any spies. Most infamously to Alberta, he executed Robert Raymond Cook in Fort Saskatchewan as the final person in this province to meet his end by this method. Robert had been convicted of one of the largest mass murders in our history. Seven people, his entire family murdered in their sleep. Not one of his siblings withstood this horrific onslaught. Ages three to nine, his parents as well were murdered and then stuffed into the grease pit below the house. This brings us to 1976. The debate that's raged on for centuries is finally coming to a head in one of the biggest votes in Canadian history on whether or not to abolish the death penalty. In an interview, CBC has on The Last Executioner, featuring a man in a hood to give on his take for wanting a referendum. This man called himself John Ellis and was quick in his political motivations during the interview, making a quip about the Prime Minister at the time. So I'm trying to think of how I would prepare myself to do that kind of a job. I think I'd find it very difficult. Well, then you wouldn't uh, be the man for the job. Uh, a person shouldn't have a job unless they can do it. Now, you take a coroner, he wouldn't be any good if he couldn't sign a, a death certificate. Mr. Ullman shouldn't have that job because he can't sign a death certificate. And Mr. Ullman... The Prime Minister and Mr. Diefenbaker, they are all against capital punishment. And this is why I think that the, the, the public should have a public, a public vote 
I'm not a member of parliament. You're for a referendum that the people decide rather than members of the House Definitely. of Parliament. Definitely. Because in the last, in the last one, there was 78% of the public wanted execution, wanted hangings. And yet a handful of people in Ottawa is going to decide for thousands upon thousands of people, or millions of people. The interviewers seemed to be in awe of him, asking quite reserved questions. What little facts he did give in the answers were way off to what is known to be true. You say that hanging is more humane, the most humane form of execution? Definitely. Can you explain that to me? Well, I can explain it with this knot, possibly. This is put on, on the neck, and this relates to the left ear. When, when this knot closes in a manner such as... This isn't a proper knot, by the way. When it closes, this portion here goes to the back of the neck on the spine and actually breaks the neck. It breaks the spine and, and, the, and the cord. And that man is dead from the time he hits the bottom of the rope. His heart will beat. It varies with the condition, the physical condition the man's in. But uh, his heart will beat maybe for 20, maybe 40 seconds after that. But no longer. No longer. This like the heart stops beating within 20 to 40 seconds, but in reality, it's upwards of 12 minutes. And a common misconception is that death is instantaneous. But physicians will attest that the victims certainly go through immense torture, as the necks usually do not break in the way that he claims. And most people are left to strangle there on the rope. A newspaper released a year prior seems to confirm my suspicion that he was indeed a fraud. The Sun says that the man who conducted the last hangings in Canada, all prior to 1963, died at least three years ago and a successor has not yet been appointed. The evening newspaper says it investigated reports earlier this week by an anonymous radio station caller in Montreal who claimed to be a hangman on an annual retainer from the federal government. Using the pseudonym of James Ellis, the man who made his latest call last Sunday joined other advocates of capital punishment in calling for the resignation of the Solicitor General, Warren Almond, who said he would resign before authorizing another hanging. The Sun says the federal government has never employed a hangman. Since Confederation, hangings have been the responsibility of county sheriffs under provincial jurisdiction. The province of Quebec, however, kept a quasi-official hangman on an uh, annual retainer. The paper said the man in Quebec, who called himself Camille Branchand, died sometime prior to November 1972. This fact was obtained from sheriff's offices in New Westminster, BC, and Montreal. When other provinces had a hanging, they would hire Branchand from the Quebec government. Raymond Bellanger of the Quebec Solicitor General's office also confirmed to Branchard's death several years ago and said his government has not appointed or retained a replacement. This brings us to another man who is incorrectly regarded as the last hangman in England, Albert Pierpoint, served until 1956 but resigned due to a deal to have his story written for about a half a million dollars at the time. He was known to have hung about 550 to 600 people in his time. 200 of them were from war crimes in World War II. Upon retiring, he came out against capital punishment, citing it wasn't a deterrent after he hung a man he knew. A man who frequented the same pub that Pierpoint himself did. Help the poor struggler. It's a strange name for a pub. The night the accused James Corbett killed his girlfriend in a jealous rage, Corbett had been at the bar singing Danny Boy with Pierpoint. They had even had nicknames for one another, calling each other Posh and Pish, respectively. Pierpoint was noted for saying after the hanging that, I thought if any man had a deterrent to murder poised before him, it was the troubadour whom I called Tish. He was not only aware of the rope, 
He had been the man who had handled it beside him, singing a duet. The deterrent did not work. The man who had single-handedly carried out nearly more executions in our entire history also condemned it. He went on to say, It is said to be a deterrent. I cannot agree. There have been murders since the beginning of time, and we shall go on looking for deterrents until the end of time. If death were a deterrent, I might be expected to know. It is I who faced them last, young men and girls, working men, grandmothers. I have been amazed to see the courage with which they take that walk into the unknown. It did not deter them then, and it had not deterred them when they committed what they were convicted for. All the men and women whom I have faced at the final moment convince me in what I have done that I have not prevented a single murder. Along with not deterring criminals, the sentence was known to be committed on those who were innocent. This was the case with Timothy Evans, who was hung for killing his wife and daughter. Mr. Evans claimed he was innocent and even fingered his neighbor, John Christie, as the potential murderer at the time. It took three years after he was hung for the police to arrest Christie for the murders of at least eight people, along with admitting to murdering Timothy Evans' family. This miscarriage of justice was a major factor in the abolition of capital punishment in the UK of 1965. The loss of this innocent man swept newspapers after this conviction came out. The impersonator of John Ellis that was featured by CBC went on to say that a doctor shouldn't go against their oath to do any harm, but shouldn't the government that is there to protect the people also do no harm? For if we are a government of the people, are we not all the executioner? The places that are to repeal the death penalty are only places that have forgotten the true horrors of what a government can do when these messteps happen. If you support the death penalty, and only one, sim one single innocent person is killed, and killing an innocent person is murder, then you become murderers, and so you also deserve to be killed. This is the paradox of the death penalty, and you cannot avoid this paradox. The way of executions left remaining are not easy on the condemned, only the one doing them. Even modern-day executioners that have been interviewed have been known to say things like, I had a choice. I would choose death by electrocution. That's more like cutting your lights off and on. It's a button you push once, and then the machine just runs by itself. It relieves you from being attached to it in some ways. You can't see the current go through the body, but with chemicals, it takes a while because you're dealing with three separate chemicals. You're on the other end with a needle in your hand. You can see the reaction of the body. You can see it going down the clear tube. So you actually see the chemical going down the line and into the arm. You see the effects of it. You're more attached to it. I know because I have done it. Death by electrocution in some ways seems more humane. I was just working in the shop and all of a sudden something just triggered in me and I started shaking and tears, uncontrollable tears were coming out of my eyes. And what it was, was something triggered within me and it just, everybody, all of them, all of those executions, all of a sudden, all sprung forward. Duh. I, I really had no goal with this video. I just kind of started actually writing things down that I researched because I was 
researching about Robert Raymond Cook a little bit because I wanted to make a video about that and then I kind of got off on this for a while so I just started writing when I got down and it kind of just made a pattern from what I thought and you know this is like the real result of capital punishment in my opinion you know no justice is served when we're all collectively murdering you know there's a big difference between someone maybe destroying another life as it compared to all of us unquestionably destroying not only the condemned person's life but the guards and the executioners who are forced to do your will you know how many more innocent lives will be destroyed by this burden of institutionalized murder the men i've looked at in the past were forced to give up their humanity for you stood against this and I am I think so do I so yeah thanks for watching this a little bit of a heavier episode uh, we're gonna do a couple more like this kind of scripted events so make sure to subscribe if it's your first time here I'm gonna flick that mosquito and I really appreciate it it does help a lot on YouTube's algorithm now and leave a comment let me know if i got anything wrong that i can fix in a future video or whatever that'd be appreciated even or some maybe you'd like me to talk about anything just just tell me just tell me just tell me